Um, would you check and make sure it's, it is okay? All right. When God began to speak to me a, a word about in the middle of the night, God said a prophetic company. I checked. Uh, I checked on the uh, the internet. I just typed that in to see what the concepts of prophetic company. And there was a lot. There was a lot of stuff that said prophetic company. Uh, and most of them uh, were talking about uh, people, prophets teaching other people to prophesy. Uh, that, that everybody should prophesy. That's not the, not the concept I believe God was talking in. And I'll show you why as we begin again in the message. Let's start with John 15. Uh, verse, I'm going to start with verse 1 through 15. Um, and I want to start uh, uh, like uh, um, Matthew and I both have said before, um, is whenever we read something, we want to find out what it's there for, what's before and after. It usually brings more uh, insight to what he's saying. But the 15th verse is the major, the main thing I want to, want to get to here, but to do that, let's begin with verse 15. Now, I'm, some of this stuff we have taught recently uh, before, but in a, this is going to be a little different aspect or maybe a little uh, step beyond. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, verse 1, said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit... He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He purges, that it might bring forth more fruit. So, the objective I think He sets uh, at the beginning of His lesson here, the beginning of His message, is that He's doing a work in the people. And He's speaking to His disciples here. I think He demonstrated in His disciples the same thing he wants to de wants to uh, do in us. So as uh, he says, now we are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now, I think that's a key to what's happening today. Is that there, in order for us there to be a cleansing, a righteousness in the body of Christ, there has to be. Um, the Word of God freely flowing uh, to bring us to a place where that we are walking clean before God. Now, uh, now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken to you. Um, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Now, there's some key elements here. First of all, you can't be clean without the Word. And secondly, uh, is we have to realize that we are the branch and we can't bear fruit of ourselves. Now, you say, well, that, that should be a no-brainer. But I, don't, I see a lot of people that are trying to bear fruit uh, of their own efforts. You know, we want to bear fruit of what God's bringing, what the Word brings. Nothing, the life of the Word has to come forth in us uh, and bring forth. Uh, Carol Maltby taught one time uh, a lesson that I've always remembered uh, is that uh, a fruit tree brings forth fruit because it's got more life in it uh, than it can contain. That the, the, the sap, the, 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 the right season, uh, the, the life that's in it begins to come to a peak and it begins to bring forth the, uh, the bud and the, the, the flower and then the fruit. So that's what we are desiring. That's what we are uh, looking for. And he says, abide in me and I in you and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me. So the key here is abiding in him. Uh, 
abiding means living and, 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 and staying in his, in his presence. Now, you know, there's so much I allow to take me out of the presence of God sometime. But I think we've got to grow to that place where we're saying, okay, my desire, 2018 for me, and I believe as we, um, as God makes opportunity and opens up the doors to what he wants, uh, that we begin to come into a place that we are abiding, living uh, in him, bearing fruit of him. If any man abide not in me, he is cast, uh, if any man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So, well, I'm not going to make hell out of that. I'm not going to make, I'm just saying that uh, he says, if any man doesn't abide in him, uh, then they are, are there, there's, I, I've been studying because it's coming up to time for, for pruning our fruit trees and stuff. I've been studying some of that. Uh, and um, the, the, the pruning process is necessary to, to train the tree and bring the tree to a place uh, that it can bring forth more fruit and bring forth quality fruit uh, it's for, for a couple of things. If it gets so thick then it blocks out the sunlight and can't you know I think that, that's what happens we get so cluttered, we, the church gets so cluttered with all kinds of different branches and and stuff that aren't really bearing fruit, that it blocks out the sunlight. And we know who brings the sunlight. See, we need the light. Okay. Uh, Herein is my Father glorified that he bring forth, that you bring forth much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So who's he talking about? He's talking about those that are his or his disciples, and he's training them, teaching them the responsibility that goes with being his disciples. Now, I realize we're in a day where the word responsibility and being a Christian doesn't seem to go together. But... Uh, <laughs> Whenever he saved me, whenever I entered into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there came a responsibility uh, to walk before God. There came a responsibility to stay in that relationship. He lays out here how to do that. How do we stay in relationship? Uh, not for my hurt, but not because he wants to be, but, but because he wants to bring us into that place where we are learning of him. Um, verse 9 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. You can't continue in his love unless you are obeying uh, what he says. If you keep my commandments, Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. He's telling you and me to do what he's already demonstrated. He's walked in, lived in the Father's love, uh, obeyed the commandments of the Father. And now he's demonstrating the love of God. <laughs> I don't want to get too bogged down here, but I do want you to see that, that who he's talking to, and I want you to see the kind of relationship he has with him. What he's saying here reflects his relationship. Okay? Now, uh, the, the relationship a father has with their child should never be passive and should always contain uh, certain elements. First of all, there's an, uh, there's an unconditional love, but at the same time, there's a balance of discipline. So he's saying, okay, if you're a branch, there's a submission 
to a pruning process, to a cleansing process, you're clean through the word. Pay attention to what I'm saying, I think he's saying. Okay. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, that your joy may be full. Now that's not just a, something he said in passing. That's instruction that he's giving. Okay? That's instruction that he's giving that your joy may be full. Uh, verse 12 says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now not just that you love one another. Sometimes we put up here, Oh, you got to love everybody. He didn't stop there. He said that you love one another as I have loved you. Okay? Now we're talking about a man God, the man God, Jesus, who uh, loved enough to go through the temple with a whip. He also loved enough to sleep through the storm and let the disciples learn a lesson uh, while uh, he let them get afraid. Now you can measure that any way you, you want to measure it, but he lay asleep well aware of the storm and let them go through that trying and testing. Okay. It says greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And see he brings in another level of relationship here. First of all, he's, ta he's talking to them and showing them, if you're my disciple, this is what I expect. I expect you to bear fruit. I expect you to submit to, to pruning. I expect you to, to uh, submit to the process here. I expect you to love. Uh, and then here he says, this is the, my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this and he laid down his life for his friends. He just introduced another level of relationship. We've been talking about discipleship, but now he just introduced another level of relationship here uh, that you lay down your life, uh, that you lay down life for his friends. Verse 14 says, Ye are my friends if. You know, sometimes I wish he wouldn't put if in there. You know, like, like everybody else. But he says, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now verse 15 is a, really the one I want to launch off of to where I want to go this morning. He says, henceforth I call you not servants, slaves, what? I call you not servants, for the servant knows uh, not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends for all things that I have uh, that, that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Now there's a place where I think we have to reach. I see many of the old, early churches I, as I read the Bible, and as I read the Word of God, I see many of the early church. Uh, that had, had reached that place. And maybe a few uh, through history that we saw uh, and can read behind that, that reached that place. But henceforth I call you no more servants, for the servant knoweth what his Lord doeth. But I call you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I've made known unto you. Now, I... 2018, I believe should we all should endeavor with everything in our hearts to reach that level that he trusts us. And I, you know, I, I think he does to an extent sometimes, but I think that extent is to the level that I trust myself. Uh, a lot of times because we... Uh, go through the daily lives and all that stuff, uh, we lose sight of this. Uh, but he said, I'm, I don't call you servants anymore. But I call you friends. Now I'm going to tell you, 
Most people don't identify with that. If you step outside of that uh, servant mentality, uh, I, I think it's better described slave mentality. You, you, uh, one, one preacher in a service back many years ago uh, got up and said, you've got to be like a good soldier. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, but he was talking, wasn't talking about the relationship between us and God. Because I won't always want to be that. When God speaks, I want to be that. Sir, yes, sir. But he was talking about the relationship with what was commonly known back then as uh, uh, spiritual fathers and wound up that some of them weren't too spiritual. But, um, but and I know I said that on, on the tape, and that's, that's okay. Because uh, our relationship has got to become more focused on Jesus because there's where we get out from under that uh, servant mentality. Uh, the religious systems of this world uh, will keep you under that servant mentality. Now, that being said, uh, that, that he's bringing us from that. And this prophetic company that I'm hearing God talk about uh, is in that heart of God in that place of God's heart where he says no longer servants but friends I'm going to make known unto you everything the Father saying okay now for some reason whenever I brought the next scripture in it did not um, all copy but it's Amos 3 and verse 7 and I'll read it. He says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. And I know people get people panic when you go to the Old Testament. But uh, my only response to that is the first New Testament message that was preached by Peter. Um, he went straight to the Old Testament. So uh, he says, Surely the Lord God will, will do nothing, uh, but he revealeth his secret his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will fear? And the Lord God shall uh, have spoken, who can prophesy? Now, I think, and, and it's proven through even in the New Testament, uh, that there's still a uh, a truth to that that God and this is the this is the line let me try to make it plain this is the 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 uh, thought the, the the revelation that God brought unto me is that we're sitting back looking God will you move God will you move uh, and the pattern was that every time in the scripture that there was a move of God. We go back through the Old Testament. We'll touch some of that in a moment. Uh, we're going to 1 Kings uh, 18 next. Uh, because we're looking at a, at a prophetic anointing. And what that prophetic anointing must do uh, before there's a move of God. Now we, we, I think we saw evidence of that. Uh, I, I read and watched the... Uh, the story of Azusa Street and so forth. I certainly saw uh, elements of the prophetic preparing the people for that move of God. Now, I'm not trying to go backward here because I'm, I'm not talking about just getting people together and teaching everybody to prophesy to everybody. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a true word of God and I believe it. I'm going to prophesy here this morning. There will be a fresh anointing that will come upon people with the word of God in their mouth that will speak a word that will bring people uh, to repentance, that will bring people to a fresh relationship with God that will not... <laughs> You see, we've tried to replace, and, and I believe God set us free from the, the law. I mean, I ate bacon this morning, so that's, I mean, we can go, we can nitpick and chew, but, but you know, all, all that, 
uh, I'm not sitting here uh, trying to keep the law. So I'm not under the law. Jesus uh, fulfilled the law. So now uh, there is uh, there's a responsibility to me to walk before God and uh, so on. But but that principle that he will not do anything until he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, is still, I believe, in place. Uh, and like I say, I see in every movement uh, that there was, and I'm not talking about somebody getting up and giving some big, big prophecy of judgment and condemnation. I heard one uh, the other night. There may, there may be some uh, elements of truth. I believe there's prophecies, prophecies that speak judgment in the earth and speak, uh, you know, that, that those things may very well come to pass. Uh, but what I'm talking about is a, 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 a prophetic company in the spirit and power of Elijah. And let me uh, go to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, um, because I'm going to bring some, uh, I want to bring some some balance to what I'm hearing in the spirit because it, to be honest, what I'm hearing in the spirit doesn't quite line up with some of my thoughts and opinions uh, of this uh, Elijah thing. Uh, but uh, 1 Kings 18, and this is where there's the, 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 the prophets of Baal and, and Elijah are, uh, are in this uh, whose God is whose God and and they bring their sacrifices. But in the 36th verse, he says, And it came to pass at the, at the time of the, uh, of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now, let me talk a minute about the evening sacrifice. Because there was a, a lamb slain in the morning and a lamb slain in the evening. And the time of the evening sacrifice uh, as I have seen it, and uh, whenever I first met Cheryl, I was attempting to, to teach this in uh, uh, the, the evening sacrifice in uh, the church where we were uh, at that time. But, but, uh, but the evening sacrifice, I think, lines up with what Paul said, is that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now... Uh, the morning sacrifice finished his work. Jesus was that morning sacrifice. The foundation of the world. The, 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 the first thing to happen in this age was Jesus became the, the sacrifice that took away the sin of the world. So the evening sacrifice is that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now that... That I look, I, I looked at that again, and it's still there, holy and acceptable unto God. Now, uh, that's the posture I have to God. This and who can, who makes who makes us holy? We don't make ourselves holy. Our relationship with God, we're clean through the Word. So, uh, time of the even sacrifice. We're, so we're seeing the timing of this is not just at the coming forth of Jesus. But it's the time of the evening sacrifice. The timing is very important. That Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that, that thou art God, the God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all things done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Now here is an element uh, of a true prophetic movement. Is that a true prophetic movement turns the people's hearts back to God. A true prophetic movement doesn't just say, you're doing good, go on the way you're going, you know, you're, you're headed for trouble, but I'm going to love you right on through it. But a true prophetic word will turn the hearts of the children, not the, the one of the New Testament, we'll get there in a minute, uh, but it turns the hearts back again. 
Okay? That's the spirit Elijah comes in. Now we see the spirit of Elijah, uh, not the same man every time, but the spirit of Elijah coming throughout uh, the Old and New Testament. And when he comes, it turns the hearts of the children back to God. That's not always easy. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes it comes uh, hard. Then the fire of the Lord fell. Now you have to understand, uh, Elijah's uh, prepared, prepared his sacrifice. You remember the story. I don't want to go back and read the whole story again, but, but the, the, the prophets of Baal, how they, they yelled and screamed and, and all trying to get God to accept their sacrifice. And, and you know, uh, uh, and the, they, they did all they could do. Now here, just uh, put his sacrifice there and poured en all, enough water on there that the ditch around is running with water. And, and here, uh, here Elijah is there for one purpose. He's not there to show off. He's there to obey God and that the hearts of the, uh, of the children be turned back again. Uh, verse 38, then the fire fell, uh, fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So <laughs> there's something, there's, there, there is a supernatural proving and it's coming. I will prophesy that, uh, that, that that supernatural proving is coming uh, to a company of people that will submit themselves, uh, abide in the vine, and, and, and uh, obey the commandments of the Lord. Verse 39, and when the people saw it, we're not talking about just a faith thing. I mean, I, I, yeah, we are talking about a faith thing, but we're talking about something uh, that's, gonna, that's tangible and visible uh, that people see. I believe God will raise up people that will, be, will speak a word and you're going to see something begin to happen. The people saw it and they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God, for the Lord is, uh, for the Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Take the prophet's bell. And I want you to watch what happens now. Because along with a prophetic company being proved uh, comes judgment on, I see it as, as an order. There was an order of Baal here. There was an order of false prophets that are uh, preaching their own message, doing their own thing. And Elijah said to them, take the prophets of Baal and let none of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, oh my. And, and here's the result of what's going on here. The Lord said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Now that... Uh, I, I've got enough uh, old Pentecostal left in me a little bit that that almost makes me want to shout because he says, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. All this occurred just before a move of God. All this occurred just before God began to bring, uh, uh, brought him to another place because Elijah said, I hear the sound uh, of an abundance of of rain, you know the story where Ahab reached down between his legs, pulled his skirts up, and, and he outran the chariots. So, uh, but the key I want us to see here, and, and I want us to remember, is that just before this move of God, there was a showing of the prophet and approving of the true uh, anointing, the true prophet. Now, Malachi four. Uh, and let's read verse 5 and 6 and then we'll uh, be through with the, the, the lesson here and we'll stop and uh, have some interchange here. He says, uh, uh, verse 5 says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of that great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
and he shall turn. And watch, watch, watch the prophecy of Malachi compared to what Elijah did and what Elijah said about turning the hearts. He said, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children uh, to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, what's he saying? Well, what's the, what's the prophetic word? The hearts of the children had to be turned to the fathers, the fathers of the children, or uh, he has to return and smite the earth with a curse. Now, uh, let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke here. Uh, Luke, the first chapter, beginning with verse 13. Now, this is where the, the angel is coming to uh, Zechariah to announce and, and give him instructions about the birth of John. And, uh, but the angel Lord said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard. <laughs> I, think it, I thought it interesting uh, that when his prayer is heard, the angel Lord has to say, Fear not. You know, sometimes we pray and then, uh, and then whenever God begins to bring it to pass, uh, the enemy tries to bring fear and, and doubt and, and all. But it says, uh, but the angel of the Lord said unto Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth uh, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. Now, uh, the angel Lord tell him, tell him what's going to happen, but that I mean no, that's not the first thing to happen. That's not uh, Zacharias. The first thing to happen with Zacharias was not him rejoicing. Because, for he shall be. Let's look at what he's look at what he's saying about this child that's going to be born to Elizabeth and Zacharias. He says, "For he shall be great." in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. We saw that come, that come to pass as we studied the Christmas story. But uh, verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall, be, shall he turn to the Lord their God. See, there's, there's the same thing. There's going to be a there's a turning. When there's a true word of God, there's a turning. Uh, verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready the 